Vanderton. One is the memorial north of Brandon, Canada. And hangar one of our 30 hangars in Canada and six in the United States that trained RAF pilots and their crews and their mechanics to uh, provide uh, service to World War II in the Battle of Britain. Uh, all of the Commonwealth countries trained in the United States and Canada because this was the safest place from the war front that they could find and also the friend base. Um, I'm going to back away so you can all see the spot. Now, it all began in 1933. Well, really, it began in World War I uh, because uh, the, uh, the retribution that the Allies imposed on Germany impoverished the country so badly that it created an environment of lost hope that made it possible for a mentally disordered psych psychopath like Adolf Hitler to rise to power. And uh, this morning I had breakfast next to a retired Navy Admiral who asked me an interesting question. I will share that question with you. If someone had put a bullet in the head of Kaiser Wilhelm, what would have been the consequences? Would we have had a World War I, a World War II, a Hitler that had power? Would we have had an atomic bomb? until much later. <coughs> well, I leave that to your rich imagination to figure that out. Uh -huh. All I am going to tell you is from the stance of a reporter, the facts as I know them, and nothing more. Adolf Hitler's Nazi party was not just a dictatorship. It was a uh, it was a fascist socialist economy model. And uh, there are several varieties of socialism, one of which is atheistic socialism, which we know as communism. But there were other versions of socialism too. And the uh, the Italian and Nazi version of socialism was called fascism because they did not nationalize the big corporations. Instead, they corrupted their leadership, which amounted to virtually the same thing, loyalty. Uh, Adolf Hitler's idea was that the Aryan race was superior to all other races of humanity and were destined to rule the world for a thousand years. He even wanted to start his own religion. He wanted to purify Germany of all non-Aryans, Aryans, which meant that the Jews had to go. And uh, of course, he had his, eventually had his final solution to the Jewish problem. Uh, he wanted to unite the Third Reich, that included Austria and the other countries that uh, uh, spoke some form of, of German in their midst. Uh, the most significant one was Austria. Uh, he wanted to build a superior military force. And there, at the very outset, he realized that the Air Force ought to be a separate command, independent of the Army and Navy. 
that was his Luftwaffe. Uh, after the war, we discovered that that was probably a good idea for us. But it took a uh, court-martial of the top leader that promoted that before that got done. Uh, this October, the Air Force Association is going to be celebrating its 70th anniversary. That even precedes the birth of the Air Force as an independent nation. That's next year. Uh, the, uh, he also, as I mentioned before, uh, mobilized industry, but not by seizing it, but by corrupting it and making sure that the leaders of these businesses that could support the war effort, directly or indirectly, were among the privileged elite. The, uh, also, they had superior weapon, aircraft, submarines, missiles, and tanks. And to give Hitler credit for its due, he knew how to use them better than we did. He saw their unique uh, characteristics that would give them, their military an asymmetric advantage. And of course, he also had his blitzkrieg. But in 1939, he trashed the Treaty of Versailles, which was the World War I treaty that ended World War I. Britain declared war in 1939. France prepares for invasion and allies with Britain. And the British Commonwealth declares war. The United States waits. And that waiting is probably responsible for the deaths of over 150,000 U.S. soldiers. That's what happens when you are a coward and you try to be an isolationist, hoping a problem will go away. It didn't work then, it doesn't work today. The uh, Japan, of course, saw an opportunity and took it. The Soviet Union waits. Scandinavia and Switzerland declare neutrality. Italy joins Germany. That's where we got the Mussolini. And Mussolini adopted the same form of socialism that the Nazis did, fascism. Uh, Britain builds the Royal Air Force. Well, to do the Royal Air Force, you know, you can build hardware, but you've got to train people to fly it, to fix it, and to know how to use it. You've got to satisfy the logistics problems and everything else. They knew that they had to train. Here are some of the critical needs. The ones that I show in red are the ones I'm going to talk about. But I do acknowledge there were more. The critical solution for pilot and crew training was solved by the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan. They uh, were uh, about to train 30,000 pilots and crew. That would include maintenance and repair and a safe distance from the war theater, which would be Canada and the United States. The entire Commonwealth would participate. And the United States actually helped by, uh, with Americans that volunteered to go to Canada and, uh, and literally uh, be a part of the Royal Air Force before Congress declared war. 
They also invented the Darton bomb site, and that was on their Lancasters. The president, because he was having trouble with Congress, came up with a lend lease where we will lend them the money to lease our equipment that we were sending over to them. And that was the legal uh, workaround of Congress. And uh, the, uh, also there were six schools in the U.S. Uh, run by American civil operators that uh, also trained. They are Terrell, Texas by Major W. Long, Lancaster, California by Major C.C. C. Mosley, Miami, Oklahoma by Captain M. W. Bell, Mesa, Arizona by Mr. J. Connolly and L. Haywood, Clewiston, Florida by Mr. J. B. Riddle, Ponca City, Oklahoma by Mr. H. S. Dark. Now, Ponca City was unusual because that was the Dar School of Aeronautics that was started by the uh, principal owner, Al Dar, and the chair of Brad of Airlines. And it was located next to the Ponca City Airport. This is Hangar Number no. 1 Museum. There were over 40 of these throughout Canada. They were built identically. McGillpio lies just north of Brandon, Manitoba. So if you go up there, it's just north of town. These are the flags of the, of the nations that participated in World War II for the Allies. And that little cube in that glass <coughs> contains cottonwood seed. That was used as an insulation for the flight jackets. Uh, they also used uh, the seed of the cattail called K-pop. I actually have one of those black jackets. They issued it to us during uh, my tour of uh, the Air Force with the provision that I never give them back. Apparently they had a warehouse full of them. Uh, this is uh, some of the things that I was allowed to take pictures of inside the museum. Uh, an ISR camera, navigation instruments. Uh, this was an Aldous lamp and a flare pod. Uh, that was a radar decoy with a parachute, silver rich uh, flare pod, and a parachute with a life jacket. Uh, this was a life jacket, a life vest with survival gear for a water crash landing. And there is your garden bomb site. And uh, here's some of the uh, aircraft that are inside the hangar. And they have one on display where you climb a ladder and get in the cockpit and take a look inside. And this is the uh, test flight to nowhere. Uh, here are some of the aircraft engines, the fire pump and the fire protection chute that they use for training. And uh, here's a closer look of the Rolls-Royce engine. It was mounted upside down on fighters because they needed visibility over the props in order to know where they were and to see the enemy. Here are some badly damaged Rolls-Royce Merlin engine. And uh, here's more engines that were used for mechanic training. Here's the radio engines they used. Here's an Avro Anson 3 to 5 seater for navigation and bomb training. Uh, this is the fighter trainer. Uh, this one, the instructor sits in the back. Here's an MKI Avro Anson. Uh, the skin was removed to show the internals. Here is a reconstruction and progress of an MK4 bullet stroke, and that's behind the restored Jeep 
and Chevrolet behind it. Here is a Ford truck that was completely restored by a high school shop class in Brandon, and they did a beautiful job on it. This is a 1938 Stinson that was used by the Allies for ambulance fast transportation in ISR. Uh, I don't know what that is in the background. It looked like a DC-3, but I still don't know what it is. If anybody recognizes it, would you please tell me? Uh, this is the most feared British fighter that the Germans ever feared, the Hawker Hurricane. That sucker was fast, very agile, and it could get in and out uh, in their formations and just create havoc. And their, their gunners just weren't fast enough to react. Those things were like a, a pack of hornets. The radar was the secret weapon. Now the Germans also had radar, but they used trio vacuum tubes. The British invented a beam power tretro, which had a much more focused beam with fewer sideband problems. And their, work, their radar was in three parts, so it could be mobile. One was a power supply, the other was the antenna and receiver, and then the third was the, the monitor and uh, the instrumentation. Uh, the, rate, the British radar knew where the, Lofdash, the Luftwaffe carrier were, how many were flying, where they were headed in all weather conditions 15 minutes before the arrival on the British coast. Now we get to Alan Turing's analytical engine. Alan Turing is generally recognized as the man who shortened the war by at least two years. The German cipher machine, known as Enigma, had more than one variation. One variation was used by the Air Force of the Luftwaffe. Another version was used by the Navy and by the land troops. It had uh, a over uh, it had 110 billion combinations. It consisted of a sequence of three geared wheels with different starting points per message. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in detail. It, they changed the combination daily. And Turing's Bombay outperformed human deciphers. He called it his imitation machine. The, the key that made this possible to decode was, Jim, was German carelessness. One guy, uh, I think out of, uh, well, I'm not sure where he was, but he had a girlfriend named Silly. And uh, the, the code book of, uh, that was carried by the Navy was was uh, printed in water soluble ink. So all they had to do is throw it overboard and the ocean would destroy all images. Uh, they had five of these rotary wheels. Three of them were used. But of course you didn't know which three and you didn't know which sequence the three were used. You could not do a frequency analysis of the code because every time they used a wheel, they notched it by one. And the alphabet numbers that were around were in random order. So, and they were different for each wheel. And that was one of the things that provided the combination. 
they had uh, spring-loaded pins that would touch other pins in the second wheel, which spring-loaded and touched pins in the third wheel, which completed the electrical circuit that lit up the reverse coal, that lit the light. What they did is these guys would sign themselves. Somewhere in the message, they would put a common thing. Uh, the guy from Norway would say, quiet night. <coughs> the other one had another message. So they were really signing their uh, decoding or coding uh, because of personal pride. So that people would recognize who sent the message. Well, that helped us. Because then we found out who the guy was that had the girlfriend named Silly. Now, the reason this was so important is that the code book would describe which of the three wheels to use and their, their sequence. It also described the front panel pins. So you had three pins that had to be inserted precisely in specified holes in front of the machine. And that provided the power, electrical power of the pins. But the person producing the message was supposed to put in the first three letters of the code of the message the location of another uh, code that gave them the starting alphanumeric characters of each wheel in order. And they were supposed to change this message by message. Well, this guy didn't. He kept using his girlfriend's name. So CIL pointed to another one which said LIE. That drastically reduced the combinations from 110 billion to a heck of a lot less. And the British MI-14 were able to use set theory mathematics to decode some of these messages. Well, the weather report that came first thing in the morning by guess who? The guy with the girlfriend named Silly. It started with the words Heil Hitler. As a result, Turing did not have to decode the full message. All he had to do was decode the first two words, Heil Hitler. And with that knowledge, plus the carelessness, he was able, with his machine, to decode the message for that, all the messages for that day with, in one hour. And because of that, they knew every signal, every coordinate that the German Navy was sending to their ships to position them in place for battle. We were sending a hundred tons a week of food to Great Britain, only to have the wool packs sink them. The British people were starving in spite of our help. Once Turing, with this decoder, found out where they were headed, then our RAF and the British Navy uh, took care of business, if you know my meaning. Without a doubt, Alan Turing is probably the greatest hero of World War II. He is also the founder of artificial intelligence, which is something that is now being used in classified manners that I can't talk about. This is what the Turing's Enigma decoder looks like. It cost a hundred thousand pounds to build it. 
and um, it's, it is a, a marvelous piece. And after the war, they destroyed it. And this is a reconstruction of the original machine. This is the Enigma machine. Now, uh, the number three there, the pins, that's the three pins that you had to put an exact sequence into all one, three of those holes. There is the input, a typewriter key. There's the wheels at the top. And then this is the output. You punch a key, and then a light would light up telling you what it meant. And that's how it worked. So here's what Turing achieved. He decoded the German radio messages with one hour clip. He simulated 35 Enigma machines, which is what we now know as parallel processing. He's the inventor of, of that. He saved supply and transport ships from the Wolfpax. The German Navy was on defense everywhere. The Wolfpack subs were vulnerable to air and destroyer attack. The destroyers knew where to show up and wait. The supply and transport ships were safer than before. And the German surface ships were easier to find and sink. And that led to decoding of land-based messages. And it helped the Allied decoders to ciphers. Now, there is a war memorial at McGill Field, right across from Hangar 1. It is Canada's salute to World War II pilots and crew who were trained by this plan in, in Canada and killed in World War II. It is shaped like an airfoil on the wing. It has over 18,000 names on it and about 600 names are Americans. 1146 died in training accidents. In fact, the worst training accident was where a, uh, a plane actually landed on top of another plane, a plane that didn't get out of the way <laughs> fast enough. This is the headstone of the memorial. And this is the full memorial looking north. And this is the bronze statue of the Stulen pilot that watches over the memorial. Questions? I was a crew member on a B-17 and we had a device that we would replace the lower ball turret and call it. I'm going to ask you to use this for the benefit of the yeah. others. Uh, I just asked him the question about we would replace the lower ball turret on the B-17 and with radar and they called it Mickey. Do you have some information about that? No, I don't. I was, uh, during World War II, I was playing, I, during World War II, I was uh, playing cars with my little brother under the dining room table. <laughs> <laughs> when Japan declared, uh, hit the Pearl Harbor. So I was a little young then to know about all this stuff. Anyone else? <laughs> one, one little uh, aside on the, uh, I'm sorry, I don't need that. Okay. One, on the uh, Hitler's purification of, of the Aryans, you know, any, any Aryan, even in, in Germany, if they were mentally retarded or anything, they were eliminated. The Germans had eliminated probably 90,000 actual Germans before they even started. Uh, worrying about the Jews. So. Well, they didn't put themselves If nothing else, I do have an announcement. Most of you already know about it. But I brought in 20 uh, copies of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States with all 27 amendments. And there's a few left on the table if anybody wants one that didn't uh, get one. Thank you. Thank you.